one of Doxicon. Welcome to session one of Doxicon. We have a couple of fascinating talks lined up for this session, but first, just a little housekeeping. Uh, you may use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen at any time during the talks. We will collect the questions and provide a selection for our speakers during the session Q&A, which will take place after both speakers have had a chance to speak. Our first speaker in this session is Eve Tushnet, a blogger and published author whose books include Punishment, A Love Story, Amends, A Novel, Gay and Catholic, Accepting My Sexuality, Finding Community, Living My Faith, and the forthcoming tenderness, uh, forthcoming tenderness, a gay Christian guide to unlearning rejection and experiencing God's extravagant love. Eve is speaking about going beyond kicking butt, countercultural representations of strength and victory, using a variety of texts from horror to philosophy to apparently folklore. Eve's talk will be examining a variety of topics such as violence, victory, healing, and reconciliation in the fantasy tale. Eve. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, it is 15 minutes before I usually wake up, so I hope that uh, I'm together enough to do this. <laughs> Uh, but so I have 20 minutes, which I think takes me to about 10.05. So we'll see what we can do here. Uh, so I think that my starting point here was something that most of us are familiar with, the kind of standard climax of many fantasy or sci-fi tales, especially in pop culture, where the way that you know that there's a happy ending uh, is that there's a big battle and the heroes win and the bad guys lose. And then often there's a kiss. Uh, the reward for the heroes, right, is romance. Uh, and this is, you know, the, the, I almost think the Princess Bride is one of the best examples of this because it simultaneously parodies these tropes and also gives them to you uh, in a really rich form. Uh, and that's fine. Like, these are basic normal allegories. Warfare and romance are normal representations of uh, conflict uh, uh, and, re and resolution. <laughs> uh, but if they're the primary, almost the only way that we conceive of victory, uh, if, if, if our only imagery of victory is violence and our only imagery for the reward uh, of victory is romance, I think that distorts our imagination. Uh, so I wanna first suggest, I'm gonna give like a short list of my own favorite alternatives to these kinds of climax uh, in fantasy tales. Uh, and then I'm gonna look at two examples in a little more depth uh, and then turn as promised briefly to political philosophy to kind of zoom out a little. Uh, so first, other ways that your story can end, right? That your kind of, that your narrative can reach a satisfying climax that makes people truly feel they have gone on a journey with you and they've received some good thing at the end, even if it wasn't the good thing that they expected. Uh, I think one very common one is knowledge. Uh, and you'll see that again in, in one of the examples I'm gonna use here, uh, that the heroes have come to understand something that they did not know before. And it may be a bittersweet knowledge. It may be not the knowledge that they wanted. It may not be an answer. It may open further questions for them, but it does at least, it's a discovery that they have made because of the sacrifices that they've made in the journey that they've been on. Uh, some stories, and I have to say, especially in children's literature, which is unfortunate, I would love to see more of this in other uh, forms of genre literature, but uh, friendship sometimes takes the place of romance. And for me, this is especially powerful when the friendship that is forged at the end that we see in its kind of honeymoon stage at the end of the narrative is a friendship between people who had been antagonists. Uh, then mm, 
there are narratives where the kind of reward at the end is almost like you well so okay no i'll say uh there are narratives where the reward at the end is liberation that a group of people who have been captive are now freed and we'll see that again in one of the examples that i'll use uh in a moment uh and in a certain way, and so the, the huge, powerful, emotional climax is them like escaping their jailbreak. Uh, and in a certain way, that is a subset of narratives in which the happy ending is that you're released into what kind of you might call normal life. I don't love that way of talking about it, but it kind of gets at what I mean. People who have been forced to live out these narratives of suffering and redemption, at the end of them, get to like open up a tea shop or start a family uh, or have other kind of like small joys, satisfactions. Uh, the business of everyday life begins again, kind of the shield of Achilles ending where uh, daily life is restored in small ways. And that narrative, I have to say, is especially powerful to me as someone in like fairly traditional addiction recovery, because it is so resonant with that practice of daily gratitude that like at the end of this epic spiritual struggle, your reward is that you get to like have a mug of cocoa on your front steps and like say hello to your neighbors and have a phone call with your mom. Uh, and that kind of ending can give a genuine feeling of peace and restoration and kind of like freedom. Uh, that's similar to what I would call the return of spring narrative, where a land that has been devastated uh, has its first experiences of restoration. Uh, and you can also tell that story in a way that emphasizes the hard work ahead. Uh, that the land which had been devastated for so long now needs to be restored, but that's a kind of work and a kind of project that feels hopeful uh, instead of the kind of fraught, terrifying work of the main story. Now we have a work of hope and of kind of like daily labor. Uh, so those are my own, my own favorite alternatives to the big battle and then the big kiss. Uh, I assume that many of you have your own uh, favorites that maybe we can get into in the Q&A. Uh, but I want to do quickly a couple examples of how this can work and the complexities that it can draw in. Uh, one is a comic book series called Elf Quest uh, that was started in the late 70s, ran for a long time, but I'm only going to talk about the first major narrative arc, the actual quest of the elves. So the, el the first elves that we meet in Elf Quest are called Wolf Riders. They are bonded to wolves, they ride wolves, they have some kind of mystical connection with them. Uh, and they know that they have lost contact in some way with their origins. Uh, in the first book, they discover that there are other kinds of, that there are other groups of elves in the world who live differently from them. Uh, and that's the beginning of the narrative of alliances and discoveries that will form a lot of the the quest that they go on in book two. In book two, their quest begins. And this is a quest for knowledge, for knowledge about their origins, especially. Where did we come from? How did we end up in this world that seems so hostile to us in so many ways? Uh, and as they go on this quest, they learn a lot of things about themselves. They journey across the face of the world. They meet many other kinds of elves. They begin to forge alliances with, with groups they had thought of as enemies, like humans and even trolls. Uh, and then, and they're searching for the home place, the place that they come from. Uh, and they find it. But, and it, at the point that they find it, there is a big battle. I'm going to do spoilers for all this stuff. I hope it won't actually take away any of your pleasure in, if you go out and look for these narratives. Um, but so there is a big battle because the home place, uh, the, the, we know from the very beginning that this is a crash landed spaceship, that they're, the, the elves are essentially aliens. Uh, but the home place is being controlled by trolls. So there's a huge war between the elves and the trolls. It's fairly harrowing. Uh, 
but that is not actually really the climax. That's not the moment that everything is leading up to. What it's all leading up to is a very small moment when the elves enter the castle, the, the, the crash spaceship, uh, and they discover a starving she-wolf, uh, the only creature that's left there. And as they come closer to the wolf who's shying away from them, she transforms into an elf. And this is their ancestress. This is the first wolf rider who in order to survive on this planet, uh, mystically bonded and physically bonded with the wolves there, with the creatures of that world. And what they learn from this is not really they don't like they don't learn anything about that there are aliens that crash land on a spaceship. What they learn is that unlike all other elves, they have shortened their lifespan. They've become uh, mortal. They've tasted death, uh, and they can no longer expect the long lifespans that other elves could experience. Uh, and that is, and they sort of discover this. They meet their ancestress. She has now become so deeply embedded in the life of a wolf that she can't really communicate with them that well. And she goes away, having left them with this like poignant, quite bittersweet knowledge that simultaneously bonds them to their world and separates them from all other elves. So she gives them knowledge of themselves, which is a kind of being at home, Self-knowledge is a way of sort of being at home in oneself. And she makes them more at home in their world. She proves to them their world is more the home place than this castle that they were seeking. And she also leaves them with a lot of, of sorrow uh, and a feeling of gain and loss. Uh, the, the, one of the things that I like about this narrative, both of the narratives I'm going to talk about, is that there isn't a relief of responsibility at the end. You don't get to just shed leadership because now the battle is over. Uh, there is, mm, you haven't kind of like solved your problems. You've just changed the conditions under which you're living them out. <laughs> uh, and that's a big part of what happens at the end of uh, The Last Unicorn. This is a novel, it's also a movie, it's a beautiful movie, uh, but I was looking at the novel uh, published, I wanna say in the late 60s by Peter S. Beagle. Uh, and I have to say, I'm gonna tell you like what happens at the end, but it's when I was leafing back through it to prepare this talk, it's so beautiful uh, and it's so well written and there's so many kind of twists and unexpected details that I hope if this is at all intriguing to you, you'll seek it out because there's way more in it than I'm gonna be able to convey to you. Uh, the basic setup is, a un it's also a quest story, which I think is one of the easiest ways to get out of the big battle against the villain at the end. Uh, but a unicorn who lives alone learns that she may be the last of her kind. She discovers that all the other unicorns have been captured by an evil king uh, using the power of a mystical red bull. The red bull has herded up all the other unicorns in the world and driven them into the sea where they are held captive. Uh, she journeys with her companions to the castle where the evil king lives. In order to protect her from the red bull, she is disguised as a human mortal woman. And in this disguise, she falls in love with the prince, the foster son of the evil king. And he falls in love with her. She now reaches the point where she wants to give up her quest. She wants to shed her immortality, live as a woman, marry the prince who loves her. But that is not how it turns out. She finds herself on the beach in front of the sea where all the unicorns are held captive, in the form of a unicorn again, confronting the Red Bull. And he is able to menace her. He operates kind of like despair. He cuts off every possible angle when she tries to run. Uh, and he, he essentially kind of persuades her to begin backing away into the sea. Uh, he never kind of physically harms her, but he overwhelms her. He makes her feel that there is no way out. And as she begins to go into the sea with the other unicorns, the prince who loves her, knowing that he will die, knowing that the bull will kill him, 
leaps in between her and the bull. The bull does kill him. Uh, and it is at this moment that the unicorn screams. And it's described as a mortal sound. She's not kind of crying out as an immortal mystical being. There's like a, there's a deep kind of mm, helplessness in her cry. But at that moment, she turns and begins uh, advancing on the bull. She kind of like charges the bull. Uh, she can't physically attack him. He's not that kind of being. Her horn never makes contact. He's like a shadow. But uh, she shocks him. Nobody's fought back against the bull. And so he, she manages to get around on him and begin backing him into the sea. She backs him into the sea. Uh, and as he, again, like in bewilderment that she's even doing this, uh, as he backs into the sea, all the unicorns come out. They're all released all at once in a genuinely quite violent scene. Uh, and it's the thunder of their hooves as they escape, like a cloudburst of chains is what it says in the book. It's that pounding of their hooves that destroys the castle of the evil king and casts him into the sea. Uh, the unicorn, by the magic of her horn, restores the prince to life, but they do not reunite. Uh, she has to accept that she is a unicorn. She has been changed by her time with people. Uh, she knows regret now, which no unicorn knows. Uh, and she knows love, which no unicorn knows. Uh, but she cannot actually simply be a human woman who loves her prince. And he can't simply follow her. He has responsibilities to the land that his foster father essentially destroyed. He has to restore it. And so the end has the prince kind of going through the land, trying to do good, good and looking for signs that the unicorns live there signs that a unicorn has passed by. The two of them are gonna seek one another out in these signs in the land and in memory, but they're not actually going to have kind of the hoped for reunion. Uh, it's a deeply poignant uh, <laughs> image of kind of life as, well, in fact, the, the book itself says there are no happy endings because nothing ends. It's an ending that feels deeply right, deeply satisfying. You feel like everyone <laughs> has gotten what they need, what, that it's all worked out the way somehow it should, uh, even though it has left them with a deep kind of like longing. It's in fact intensified their longings rather than sated them. And in some ways, I think that's the mark of a good ending. Uh, so, I'm gonna skip the political philosophy because we I don't have time for it. Uh, but what I wanna leave with then is what is what, that, that question of what is the mark of a satisfying ending? For me, I think often it's not that the characters get what they want, uh, but that they get their, their heart's desire in its most unprepossessing form. Uh, they prove themselves willing to lose what they want most, what they value most, and in doing so, kind of discover who they are. Uh, there's a quote from the author Elif Batuman. Uh, a short story says, I looked for X and didn't find it, or I was not looking anymore, and then I found X. A novel says, I looked for X and found A, B, C, G, Q, R, and W. And I think both of the stories that I used as examples, ElfQuest, which is the she-wolf one, by the way, um, ElfQuest and The Last Unicorn, these are both stories of people who are, who know that they are looking for X and the things that they find reshape their idea of what X is uh, and also their, and their ideas of who they are. They're, in some ways they do get their heart's desire but they get it in a form which reflects kind of the brokenness of the world around them and again, uh, leaves them with a more intense longing and a more intense awareness of lack than before. And that awareness in itself 
is satisfying for them and a kind of victory. Okay, I think that, I think I'm now out of time, so I'm gonna stop there, but that I hope opens up some places for uh, questions and further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. I took a lot of notes during your talk. Um, our second speaker is Matushka Sarabegli, a graduate of Holy Cross Orthodox School of Theology with degrees focusing on iconography and theological aesthetics. She currently resides in Tennessee with her husband and two young children. And according to her blurb, they are all nerds, which uh, certainly resonates with us here at Doxicon. Her talk, Shadows and Mirrors in Time and Space, is about actually one of my favorite topics, Doctor Who and the TARDIS. Though the doctor often seems to operate outside the context of faith, Batushka will look at how we as Christians can find God's truths manifested during the doctor's adventures in time and space. Batushka. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, okay. <sighs> where do I, oh, now I know where I start with this one. All right. I'm going to try to share some videos during this. I tested. I think this should work. So let's see what I can do. There we are. Okay. Assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually, from a non linear, non subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. Whoa. All right, I'm back or not. People assume there we go. Time is so, a I hope everybody could see that. Um, I started with that because <coughs> ugh, there we go. Um, I came to the Doctor Who train kind of late in, I don't want to say late in my life, but late in it. And a friend of mine got me started on that. He said, you want to watch the reboot? They just rebooted this classic series. You want to watch it. And I saw that episode after a while and I jumped up off my couch and just went, yes, yes, that that's how this works. Um, and I use that particular phrase, the, the time is a big ball of wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. Every time I talk to kids about how uh, services during Holy Week work, and most times when I do church tours and talk about icons. And yes, <laughs> I use Doctor Who when I talk about icons and temporal theology. Can you call it temporal theology? I don't know. Um, that and Deep Space Nine Emissary 1 and 2. But I do that because it works humans are linear god is not linear in the church sometimes we talk in a way that's not linear like how can we be with the disciples that are going into jerusalem with jesus how can we do that this is how we can do that because time is different so when i see a thing like this i recognize the thing i go back to the church i check out what's there you ask god you discuss things with other people and you go yep it's that thing that's that bit that I heard in church that I didn't quite understand. There it is. Um, so that's what I'm going to do <laughs> with Doctor Who. Now, there's a lot you can do with this. Um, and we're just going to pick one. But here we go. Uh, I just want to quick give you some context about where I'm coming from with this. Um, hopefully, everyone is at least familiar with St. Basil's advice to young men slash students and i work with kids a lot so it's one of those things that everyone's heard um you know you know be the bee kind of thing but the bit i really like is when he says into the life eternal holy scriptures lead us which teach us through divine words but so long as our immaturity forbids our understanding their deep thought we exercise our spiritual perceptions upon profane writings, which are not altogether different, and in which we perceive the truth as if it were in shadows and mirrors. So the Holy Scriptures, and I would add all the traditions of the church herself, uh, icons, hymnology, not to mention the liturgy and all the sacraments, all of it, let us in on the divine life. But we have to remember that God's nature is completely other from us. And 
so we the divine is often a bit incomprehensible this is where and you guys all know this in fantasy and science fiction it can put the same stories or concepts in a different context so we can look at it from a different angle and we can work out what's good bad helpful not helpful in a safe place and then use that in real life um next part of my context is quick basics on doctor who it's a science fiction tv show started in uh premiered on the BBC in the 60s, went until the 80s, went dormant for a little while, got a reboot in the early 2000s, and has been going ever since, sometimes as a serial, sometimes kind of sporadically as specials. It's the adventures of a humanoid time lord who travels through space and time with a variety of companions. This is an important point. We'll come back later. Um, usually human, but not exclusively. And the doctor can regenerate. This is a fabulous way to keep your character going. They can change outward appearance, but remain the same person. Um, there's been 13 plus one in total for now. So for this, I'm just going to confine my examples to Doctors 9 through 12. I'm not as familiar with the classic Doctor Who. I know it's there, but I haven't. Again, this is just where I came to it. I would love to hear more examples of what we're going to talk about in three seconds um, from the classics and the Q&A, let me know. I'm always looking for more info. So Doctor Who is a solidly secular show. It is. It's not trying to be an allegory. It's not trying to be anything. So it makes it a great candidate to find those shadows and mirrors. And I think it's more powerful when it does. Because if you're, you have something that's not setting out to try to do any kind of theology and you can find that truth, that good story, the true story in it, it, it makes it so much more powerful. So you've got another clip. Um, so what I'm going to talk about specifically with Doctor Who is uh, so it's, uh, the TARDIS's communion, if you're familiar with uh, Zazulis's work being as communion. This is what we're talking about, the necessity of communion. It is an integral part of the show from the very beginning. So I was going to show a clip. I think I'm not going to know. Anyway, so Christians exist in community. Yes, it's part of our nature as human beings. God created us this way. God said, let us, God is community, uh, make man in our image according to our likeness, Genesis. The, the Trinity, this is our God, God is community. St. Basil says the unity of God lies in the communion, the kinonia of the Godhead. We're getting into kind of not high theology, but it can go there. Um, God is social, conciliar, news Russian word, sobornost. Um, Zazulus would say the being of God is a relational being. God is love. This necessitates a community. So humans then require the same community. It's our shared image and likeness with God. Um, in a Callistos Ware article, he quotes someone um, named Richard of St. Victor in his De Trinite. And he says, the perfection of one person requires the fellowship of another. Now, this particular uh, theological anthropology can get kind of high. I tend to work with kids a lot. And when it's an immediately obvious concept, but when you read things like um, Zizoulis or like St. Maximus the Confessor, it can get a little cerebral, but it's not. I mean, you go to church, you know that we have community, that we need community. Um, services require more than one person. Liturgy, work of the people. Communion, literally, communion, um, is that sacrament of uniting ourselves with Christ. Loving God requires loving others. We love our neighbor. Um, the sheep and the goats parable. You have to have people in order to get to the kingdom. Love our enemies, not just love your friends, love your enemies. Um, even hermits require to go to church to receive the sacraments. Uh, I joked with my, my father, who's a teacher at a seminary, that if his students find being his communion a little tough to slog through, watch Doctor Who, because the doctor always, always with some notable exceptions, has companions. Um, in the show, it's kind of used as a storytelling device from the very beginning. You know, these are these are the humans that we can relate to as we see this being, this other, that's the doctor. Um, but it's still a necessity. The show doesn't work without it. Because the doctor is defined by those relationships. Literally, he's called the doctor by one of his first companions because he's a smart guy and, you know, Therefore, he's the he's must be a doctor, and he just kind of lets it go. Uh, later in the reboot, they go into that his name is a promise to help others 
it, I will leave that bit of nerd to Malone. It gets a little blurry how that works, but it's always, he's defined by those relationships with other people. They're necessary to him. Um, that promise that I mentioned, he tells one of his later companions, Clara, that it's never to be cruel or cowardly, never to give in or never to give up. Um, there's another um, one of his companions, River Song, who says that, you know, the doctor is a word for healer, for wise man. We get that word from you, meaning their experience of him is how they got the name the doctor to begin with. So having those companions is necessary, not just as a plot device for the show, but for him to learn about humanity and for them to see the world. There's a lot of give and take there as much as it's like, you know, oh, these are silly human beings and pudding brains and I travel around with them to show them that their world is wider than they think. Um, they learn, he learns compassion or how to be nice, sometimes quite literally <laughs> from them. Um, or that they'll do unexpected things and he learns because remember he's, he's different than them. And that give and take is, is an integral part of the show. But what I really like that the show brings out is that when he doesn't, or she, I should mention some, my experience with doctors, he, he can be a she at some point. Um, anyway, when the doctor doesn't have companions, bad things can happen. He's, he is a time lord, so he can travel throughout time and space and they can do all sorts of insane things. Um, but he has a lot of rules to govern that power that he has. And what happens when there isn't somebody else with him to kind of remind him either why he has those rules or why he can't do X, Y, and Z, uh, he can do some things that are not so good. So let me pull up quick another little video here. I'll just give some background on what this is. Um, this is the 10th Doctor, David Tennant. And he's just saved a woman from dying on Mars. There was a colony there and she's supposed to have died so that her um, whole time stream thing gets confusing, but he, she, she's supposed to have died. And when she dies, her daughter, granddaughter, granddaughter, yes. Oh, I just had a brain block. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, she, <laughs> she, goes through her career in order to, you know what, I'll just let you watch the clip and you'll see, it makes sense. He disrupts the timeline and he thinks it's good, but it's not good. So let's see if we can, if we can get this one to work. Here we go, maybe, there we go. There we go. The whole of history could change. The future of the human race. No one should have that much power. Oh, oh no. Ah, sorry, uh, everybody. Is to make college easier because sometimes have a lot YouTube of doesn't like me. All right, there we go. Uh, We're back. You should have left us there. I I've done this sort of thing before. It's always such a little people. But never someone as important as you. Oh, I'm good. Little people. What, like Mia and Yuri? Who decides they're so unimportant? You? For a long time now, I thought I was just a survivor, but I'm not. I'm a winner. That's who I am. The Time Lord Victorious. And there's no one to stop you. No. This is wrong, Doctor. I don't care who you are the time lord victorious is wrong um she then goes on to unfortunately have to fix the timeline herself by committing suicide but it's that it's that moment of going you what you think would be a good thing like oh yes he just saved my life going this is no you shouldn't have that kind of power this is wrong um and there are are numerous examples um, of his companions blatantly telling him, you, you shouldn't be alone because when you're alone, you do bad things. Um, there's another one. Um, I'm one of those persons that, that I can tell a story, but sometimes I like the characters themselves to tell stories. So we've got one more. 
Uh, so uh, backstory behind this one, the doctor tends to lose his companions quite a lot, which is sad. He's immortal. They come, they go. But um, one of them has just left and is, is leaving him kind of backwards through history. Again, that timey-wimey thing. A note telling him, don't be alone. Um, so I think we'll just do that. Thank you for bearing with me as I navigate the fun that is technology. All right, here we go. Maybe, maybe, there we are. I think once we're gone, you won't be coming back here for a while and you might be alone, which you should never be. Don't be alone, doctor. And do one more thing for me. All right. And then tells her to basically go find herself. Um, there's also a moment, I had the clip, but I would just say go, even if you, you haven't ever watched Doctor Who, there's the um, 50th anniversary special. I'd highly recommend it because they're trying to solve a problem. And not only do the companions come and help him, but like happens in Doctor Who every so often, all the doctors, <laughs> the different incarnations will get together and they're trying to solve a problem. And literally one of them says like, we can do this, there's three of us now. Meaning not only do we have that other community, we now have ourselves to solve this big problem. And they end up being able to essentially save their entire planet by all of them working together. Um, there's in another one of, it's a, a David Tennant episode right before he leaves, they have all of his various companions over the years get back together in the TARDIS and they're all working this big machine. And it's, I mean, it's really over emotional. The music is over the top, but what it does is say like, this community is important, which is all the more sad than when he loses it. But it's really really important to the show and when you don't have it when you don't have that community of people helping you navigate not only your life but really all of time um you can do things that are very bad because you don't have that i keep saying community but you don't have that that sobernost that trinitarian unity that we need as christians and there it is it's manifest right there um in in a science fiction show. So no one is ever perfect. Um, situations ever changing, but through community, we can do amazing things. Um, and lastly, because I think I'm probably running a little bit out of time, uh, back to St. Basil for a moment. He says that um, we imitate those who perform the exercises of military practice for they acquire skill in gymnastics and dancing and then reap in battle the reward of their training. Meaning that just like some football players do, you can take ballet and it still will help you in your military career, your football career. This is doing the same thing. I think that watching a show, um, especially Doctor Who, can show you, um, what was I going to say, can, can help you in that practice of working out how your, what, what your faith looks like in real life but in a fantasy space um, so that you can then go out and do it in your real life. The, the other thing that this show does, and it, oh, oh, there's just so much here to look at there. If, you, if, you, if you've watched the show, you know, and if you haven't, go look at any of it. The themes of self-sacrifice and self-denial and, and forgiveness are all over the place in there. There are some not so nice things too, but those, um, that are in there are, are great for understanding maybe a more higher complicated theology, but also great as starting discussions. When I told a friend of mine who was a massive Doctor Who fan that I was doing this, we started just, just talking about things like, did you see this? What do you think about this? I don't know if that works. And that's really, really wonderful. Um, especially when, again, I talk to kids and young people a lot, when they're afraid to talk about, or not afraid, not unsure of how to talk about uh, church or theological issues, this will get them start talking because, oh, I know this, I understand it when I see the doctor do it, or when I see Clara tell the doctor, you know, don't, don't be alone, you're bad at it, and also, by the way, um, yeah, just don't ever be alone and be bossy. Anyway, 
um, sorry, I get excited and I run on tangents. Um, yeah, we see the thing, we recognize the thing, we go check with the church and check with God and talk to other people about the thing and go, yep, it's that thing. Uh, so that's, that's being <laughs> the TARDIS is communion. Um, hopefully I would love to hear in any questions or Q and A later about more examples of this. Uh, my friend and I actually had, are now starting a list of all the lovely theological things we can find in Dr. Who just for fun. So I would, I would love to hear more, especially from the classics. If, if people have more, you know, little episodes or things they'd like to share. So I, I, I hope I'm not done too terribly early. I think I'm right on time. Maybe. I think you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, I was thinking as you were speaking, um, you know, your, your title, Shadows and Mirrors, I was actually thinking of a couple of specific things like the Vashta Narada in the shadows. Oh, am I muted? No. No. Uh, like the Vashta Narada in the shadows in the family of blood in which the, the fury of the Time Lord consigns one of the family of blood to the insides of a mirror, I believe it is. Um, mm. So it was kind of neat to see that, but I'm, as you were talking, and I have a question for Eve too to lead us off and please everybody uh, put your questions in the Q&A so that we can have more questions than just my own questions. But um, I was thinking as you were talking about the bad things that can happen when the doctor is alone, uh, the plus one doctor, the war doctor, um, never has a companion. And uh, until, as you say, the other two current doctors come, come with him and form a, a community. So I really love that koinonia idea. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to the bad thing that that doctor is, you know, planning to do and how that actually impacts the lives of the other three doctors who follow him. Oh, in that particular episode? Oh, the, the 50th anniversary? Well, it, is, yeah. it is the 50th anniversary episode, but the thing that he plans to do has a major impact on the ninth doctor, the 10th doctor, and the 11th doctor until the, the 10th and 11th meet him. And yeah, he's going result. to destroy his entire planet, essentially, in order to stop a war. Um, because I, I don't have, do I have them here? No, I don't have. My, my daughter has stolen all my little Dalek toys. Um, but the robots that can't climb stairs and then can um, <laughs> are destroying the Time Lord planet. And so there is his solution, the, oh my gosh, I can't remember the actor's name now, um, who plays the War Doctor. It's John Hurt. There we go. It's like, I need my husband yelling, yelling things in the back. Um, he, he says, well, I'll just, you know, we'll destroy the entire planet. Um, and I, I forget the little MacGuffin thing that they have that the button will press and destroy the entire thing because this will stop the war. If I destroy all the Daleks and all the Time Lords, the war will just stop. Um, which, if you think about it, uh, it it's funny because I came to the reboot, so I didn't realize that in the classics you had him interacting with other Time Lords because in the reboot you just don't see them. He just says, they're all gone. I'm the last one. Um, and this is why, because he killed them all. And he's living with that guilt and that regret which is interestingly why he becomes first first angry and then like young and goofy because that's how he deals with um, the, the, oh my gosh, not the PTSD, but like the, the horror of basically destroying his entire people, not only the ones that were fighting, but all the children, all the families, they're all gone and he's left. So when he has that decision weirdly to make over again with other people, he does it he finds another way. And that other way can only be found through community. He couldn't have done it himself. Um, there's a very, I don't know why it reminds me of Star Trek, actually, this very pseudoscientific kind of, if we all get together and all the TARDISes are making all these calculations, we can figure out how to freeze the planet and put it in, in a moment of time and then put it into a picture. And when I rewatched it again, I was like, I don't know how that can work. It doesn't matter. The point is, couldn't do it by himself. When he's by himself, he does a horrible thing. He just says, I'll just get rid of everybody else and that will stop it. But together they go, through our combined talents and our, our, our combined calculations, we can fix this situation. So yeah, that, that's 
Um, and I think that that kind of dovetails nicely into Eve's talk about finding another way, you know, another way besides uh, the violence. I was, I was actually thinking of some narratives in which, and I, I, I'm wondering if Eve can speak to this, I'm thinking of some narratives in which we do have battles, but the main hero finds a way to resolve the situation without actually killing uh, the opponent. So I'm thinking in particular of like Luke Skywalker, Aang the Avatar, Harry Potter. And I'm wondering about that middle space where you actually do have violence, but in the end, the hero finds a different way to uh, resolve the conflict. Um, I was just wondering if you could maybe speak to that. And, and does that have a place in your, um, in your framework? Oh, sure. So, you know, so one thing is like everything has a, a place, right? I think there is a place for narratives where the battle really is the image of conflict that we're being given. It's like, it's, an, it's usually more allegorical, uh, but it's sort of a standard allegorical image of uh, self-conquest or conquest of whatever one's uh, besetting sins or enemies are. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know Star Wars or Avatar at all well, but so I will use uh, uh, two examples, one that I think does this really well and one that I think does not really. Uh, Tolkien, who I told myself, you're just not gonna do it. You don't know it well enough. And everyone also knows this story already. But the Lord of the Rings, right, is a narrative that has enormous battle scenes and is shaped around uh, both quest and to some extent war. Uh, and yet, like the climactic moment is the destruction of the ring. Um, it's not, it's a tr profoundly nonviolent moment. Uh, and a moment of uh, of sacrifice. Um, one of the things that I wanted to get into and ran out of time for uh, was narratives of martyrdom, where violence is the language in which victory is spoken, but it's the suffering of violence uh, rather than the inflicting of it. Um, so that's one where I really think Tolkien genuinely, I think, thought through how he wanted to portray the climax of his story and came up with something that uh, sort of like rings true both emotionally and theologically. Uh, Harry Potter, I have to say, feels to me like cheating, that Harry Potter himself never kills anybody, but everybody kills people all around him. Uh, it feels more like he personally was kind of spared that moral wound rather than that like to me to me rather than a statement being made about the failures of violence to resolve problems or something like that because violence does actually resolve a lot of their problems in harry potter uh it's just violence done by like molly weasley or somebody else <laughs> um so <clears throat> uh where was I going with this? Yeah, so I do think there's a lot of, I think a lot of storytellers do kind of feel pressure to find a different way to tell stories. And uh, because all of our images of defeat tend to be, and this is in the gospels too, right? Like the last enemy to be defeated is death. We have these images of like conflict between ally and enemy. Uh, and it's genuinely quite difficult to get beyond that. I think in some ways, both ElfQuest and The Last Unicorn do, uh, but even those have defeat of the enemy and have, or, or have major war scenes in kind of a Tolkien-esque, the war is almost in some ways a distraction from the real climax, but it is there. Um, I just, I just wanted to mention something. Actually, this is what um, got me thinking about that question. Um, because in Avatar, which you say you're not familiar with, the hero has to find a way to stop the villain, but he's been trained in pacifism. And so it really becomes a serious conflict within him. 
you know, to try to find a way other than killing him and everybody's telling him he has to kill him. So I, I, I just find that's what got me thinking about this. Um, I'm not seeing, oh, we finally have a question in the Q&A. Thank you. Um, please, uh, everybody, uh, ask us questions. Okay, so here's the question. And it says, it is interesting that these talks were paired because Eve spoke about endings while Doctor Who is almost deliberately designed to run forever. What are the different themes and narrative decisions that open up in concrete endings versus open run stories like comic books? Great question. And this is obviously for both of you. So whoever wants to go first. Yeah. So I'll, okay, I'll do it. Cause I was thinking about this actually at the beginning of Matushka Sarah's talk anyway. Uh, what is the kind of, what kind of time does your story take place in? Uh, one of the like many beauties and richnesses of The Last Unicorn is that its climax takes place both in apocalyptic time and in non-apocalyptic time. Uh, apocalypse, right? Like all of our lives, I think, pass through multiple apocalypses uh, and arguably, well, I wouldn't say arguably, uh, and in fact, as Matushka Sierra kind of gestured at, um, the eternity is constantly entering into our into time, uh, kind of most obviously in the mass or in divine liturgy. Uh, and yet we also live a lot of our lives in non-apocalyptic time, in the time of longing and kind of like act, daily acts of restoration. Uh, and the um, in the last unicorn, the liberation of the unicorns, I think, is a profoundly apocalyptic moment. Uh, the sea opens up, right, and these creatures like boil out of it, uh, and in so doing, their liberation is what casts down the powers of this world, the evil king, uh, and then they pass through, and we're left with the non-apocalyptic time of longing and kind of labor uh, that the prince and the unicorn uh, kind of walk out into. Uh, and so I think that's one way. So one way of talking about this is, are you trying to tell a story that is apocalyptic uh, and that rises to that climax of liberation? Or are you trying to tell a story that is non-apocalyptic that opens out into kind of daily work uh, that's sort of different from how do you tell a story that feels like it's going to continue running forever. That I feel like I know less about. ElfQuest did go on for quite a long time, but to be honest, to me, never recaptured the kind of like intensity of the first arc that it went through. Uh, and I guess, <sighs> And I, yeah, I'm just not sure because so much of an ending is about how the experiences that they've been through in the story change the people who went through it. And you want to both see them as they were and to see them change, but I don't know, and maybe the doctor's regenerations are like an especially profound kind of like image of that change, but I don't know how often you can work that and maybe the Doctor Who fan should now take over and say, what do the recurring regenerations kind of add to the story? And, hmm, I've been sitting here trying to figure out how to answer this question because it, it's it's one of those that, am I, yes, I'm on. Okay, I'm really bad with this. I'm such a troglodyte. Anyway, um, <laughs> <coughs> It's one of those things that started as a like a practical thing. You know, when you write a story, you're you you can't know how far it's gonna go. I'm I'm a huge Tolkien fan, and so I want the everything story. Um, but I'm married to someone that's like I want it to end and that be it. And I don't need to know everybody's backstory or an everybody's origin story. I just want the story. Um, so I see both where you're coming from. But what? Oh gosh, what it does is. 
oh, it's such a weird thing because what it, what, what the, the way that they worked the show ends up doing is you can do the little stories and the big giant stories. And so you can have the everyday, which are actually kind of, again, I keep talking about my husband, but we do this. He likes the big, the big giant stories, the stories that kind of go on forever. Um, and that, you know, have recurrences back there. And I'm a big fan of the, the every week, you know, we, we finish this story and then we go on to the next story, the daily life. Like, let's have this adventure. We've solved this problem. Let's go on to the next problem. Um, but what that particular, the way the show was set up allows you to do is tell both those stories. And because it's in time, you can then go back and revisit a concept that was 40 years ago and pick up that story from 40 years ago or um, start, you know, either, either it's done on purpose or it's just an accident. Um, put like a little line, you know, in, in episode one and then 20 episodes later, it ends up being a huge, big world changing event. Um, the bad wolf being one of those. I know he purposely put that in there. You just see something scrawled bad wolf and you're waiting the whole season going, what is this? I remember when it came out, you could even like go to Staples and on the, the pen, like trying out pad, people will have scratched it. Like any chalkboard and any cat, they will like bad wolf in the corner. <laughs> like eventually we'll find out what this is or like the, the crack in the universe. They did the same thing. Um, so you, you can, it's okay. It's like such a big world. My brain just did that. And so you can tell both those stories and I, I enjoy how that works. And also every incarnation of the doctor is, even though they're the same person, they're very different. Not just because, um, I mean, in the world of the doctor itself, you know, it's, it has to be a, a different person, but also you have different people writing it and acting it and producing it. And it, all of that really does affect what the show is. And so that's, you, you, can, you can look at this bit and say like, oh, this is what they're trying to show and this is who this person is. And then, you know, 40 years ago, it was almost a completely different doctor, but yet still the same. And I'm rambling and I'm sorry. No, no, I mean, I, actually think, that, I think that dynamic of same indifference is one answer to how do you tell a long running story? It, how you ask yourself, what are the characteristics that I, as the particular writer, think are core to this character and then put that character in a totally new and different situation and different writers as you say are going to pick different core characteristics mm -hmm. to draw out uh you see this a lot in like I, I know like x-men comics relatively well and that's one where people have radically different like you can take what you perceive to be the core characteristics of a character and take them far enough in a direction that it's now difficult to quite tell how they reconcile with someone who was taking a different understanding of the character but they've all mm, to me i actually kind of like that the kind of pick and choose and everyone ends up picking and choosing which storylines and which versions are like real to them <laughs> that man um, does the same thing <laughs> yeah yeah but i like that the idea of what you're trying to do in opening up the possibility of kind of forever running stories is the idea of how can we make this character recognizable and yet changed and both changed in himself or herself and in new circumstances. One thing that uh, now we have a couple of questions, but I just kind of wanted to add something to the discussion of the doctor because uh, this is actually coming from the classic Doctor Who. And that's that the, uh, the fact of regeneration was not intended from the beginning, but as, as uh, Matushka Sarah said, was a practical matter. The original actor, we have a, a massively popular show in Britain and the original actor um, became too ill to continue playing the part. So they found a way around his illness by inventing regeneration. And of course that becomes core to Doctor Who and to this, this never ending long running story with this immortal character. Now we have three questions. So I'm going to um, uh, see if we can get some of these. This one is for Eve. For those stories that end with redemption, forgiveness, or acceptance, where the main character comes to terms with mistakes they have made, would you count those in the same category as those that end with the gaining of new knowledge or in a category of their own? Ooh. I think that deserves to be its own thing. Um, and I would have, to be honest, I would have talked about that more if I had had uh, kind of more time to sit down and think about which 
ones I wanted to highlight. But yeah, I think those are incredibly powerful uh, stories, and uh, including stories of repentance and acceptance, restoration to community, uh, I think is another like incredibly emotionally and theologically resonant kind of ending. Okay. Um, another question, and I think this can be answered by both of you. I really like the idea of science fiction fantasy creating a space for people to play out concepts relating to faith. Uh, do you feel that Christian authors have an obligation to craft a story that provides fertile ground producing fruitful introspection? This is now dealing with Christian authors, not secular authors. Hmm. I did. I think it would just happen. See, that's the the it when if you are if you have a world if you're like a specifically Christian author you have that worldview and I'm I'm maybe reading this backward because I'm not an author but I read a lot of them. You can the the author's voice is going to come out in whatever they write, whether it's overt or kind of subtle. And so if you have that worldview and you're creating something, I think. It will be there whether you mean it to be or not. I don't know if you need to be a, a C.S. Lewis and there it is, it's allegory. Um, or it can be more subtle that you've created this and in the world when someone reads it, they can find those things which, which, um, which then they can discuss. Yeah, so I, mean, so I think that's usually what happens, right? Um, I will say, I think there are people who create art out of their doubts, out of kind of what's the world that I see at three in the morning, you know, when it all seems like maybe it's a lie. Um, and I have to say, I'm not going to say that that's wrong. I, it's trickier. Uh, I think that it is, you know, morally dicier to do that as a Christian. But you're also offering, I think, a profound kind of empathy and solidarity to people who also feel that way, uh, just in reflecting the world that they are afraid is the true world, um, that you can kind of face that and help them to face it and maybe understand it better, or see it from a new perspective. I think that's right. Uh, I because th I do think we all, anytime people are making art, it is coming out of what they see in the world in one way or another. But most of us see kind of ambivalence, you know, or like don't see only one thing or there are times when the world seems to kind of like a kaleidoscope rearrange itself into a different pattern than the one that we usually see. Uh, and if you, there's secular artists who make art from the moment when the kaleidoscope seems to rearrange itself into a kind of uh, believing world. And that can be some of the most powerful uh, religious art. And so similarly, I think, and again, I think there are moral questions, problems here, uh, but I don't think it's wrong to be the Christian who makes art from the moments when the kaleidoscope seems to show a godless world. Yeah, because when, when you know, when you have that, and this is, I'm, oh gosh, I love doing devil advocate. When someone sees that and they go, oh, I, I, I don't like that. Well, why don't you? Why does that bother you? And have it, having that question, you can start on your own little journey about why does that, why does this bother you? How do I, how do I reconcile that? How do I, not fix is the word I want, but you know, what do I need to find to figure out why that bothers me and what I need to do differently or what, how do I see it the same way? So I, I like that too. I like things that are, that are very, I think something that, that shows a world, I don't want to say not very like happy and hunky dory, but kind of like very bleak. It's not that, that, that shows as much about truth as something else does that, yeah. that looks more familiar. I think the unfamiliar can help us also find our way back. <laughs> Yeah, I'm babbling, but anyway, yes. <laughs> I think um, one of the examples of what you were saying about, you know, the Christian worldview coming out through an author's writing just as being part of who they are. I think Tolkien's Lord of the Rings is a great example of that because 
Um, people can read that and get no Christian content out of it at all. But, you know, he is definitely a Christian author. And, um, you know, Christians can read it and get a lot of introspection out of it. And it also depicts a very bleak world in which Mordor is rising, you know, and something needs to be done about that. Okay, um, another question. I agree with Eve that Harry Potter feels like cheating. Oh, my heart. <laughs> Continuing in that vein, even Harry Potter's martyrdom is incomplete. What features for you make a martyrdom account in fiction most satisfying? Oh. So I will say in the books, I really do find the I'm about to die moment with Harry Potter quite moving. Um, I thought like that worked for me. Uh, for me, I think I will say it is best when somebody really dies. <laughs> um, but there are ways of convincing me that you were genuinely willing to die and not have it happen. Ultimately, I think it's, mm, mm, trying to think how to put this, or when someone has always come across as valuing something higher than their own life, and it's that thing that they're asked to give up. That can also be a really powerful moment. There's, um, there's a children's series that I love and talk about all the time called The Borables. Uh, and my favorite character from it is this like horrible creature, horrible feral child who uh, is deeply loyal to his horrible hometown, basically, that's ruled by a tyrant. And the thing that he ultimately has to give up is that uh, kind of pride in the ways of his people. Um, and it's, be it's, clear through the whole narrative that that would be harder for him than just physical risks uh, or even risking his life. And so I think that surrender is like a profound kind of self-emptying. Uh, it requires genuine humbling on his part. Uh, and that's part of what makes it so moving. Uh, so yeah, if you can convince me that the character genuinely cares about something more than they care about their own life, then they don't have to die. <laughs> Uh, but it is always good when authors are willing to go there and just have them die. In my opinion, I don't know if, if, if you have other. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, Matushka Sarah has anything to right. say about, you know, martyrdom in fiction. Um, you know, is, the, is there any form of martyrdom in the doctor, for example? <laughs> um, oh gosh, I feel like I need to like pull up emails now. I'm one of those those people that will just start flipping through books. Because a friend of mine was actually like, "This is what you should talk about. You should talk about martyrdom and how like everyone tries to you know kill themselves." And yeah, I like when it when 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 they're like, "I'm going to die to save you know X planet or X species in this," and then they do. I I think um, from the kid me who's remembering things like, but I want everybody to be happy in the end. Um, I now go, no, sometimes this is happy. Sometimes this this is the completeness. And if you keep going, it, it's not gonna work. Sometimes this this is the truth, you end here. There's a, um, oh gosh, David Tennant's Doctor Who, he, he is trying to save, or oh gosh, I'm trying to remember the whole thing now, but anyway, he's trying to save everybody and he's ready to give up his life. And then the scene cuts and he's still alive, right? And everybody thinks he's gonna die and regenerate and he's still alive. And the deal was if he heard four knocks, he would die. And he's like, oh yes, I got through it. I didn't die, it's wonderful. And then you hear it's just like old man inside a box which is about to be flooded with gamma rays. Just like knock, 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 knock. And you're like, oh yes, he's still gonna die. Because after all that buildup and all that martyrdom, I, I was really upset. And it makes it even better because instead of saving the whole world, he's dying for one old man. Um, and he says, it's, it's my honor to do this. Because even though everyone's like, oh, the doctor really doesn't die, that, that they do. That, that, who, that singularity, that person, they do die. And you, you get hints of them, but they don't come back. Um, and just like a fangirl standpoint, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to see that. I like, I like this. I don't want to see you go. It's sad, but it, it's good when it happens. Um, again, if you ask my young daughter, she'd be like, no, they must live. They mustn't die. But sometimes it's okay. And it's good. 
Um, I was actually getting tears in my eyes when you were talking about that scene because the doctor really does not want to go. In fact, he says, I don't want to go. But I had, he, I had the clip. It's, it's super emotional. It's, it's, oh, yeah. it's, oh, it's yeah. heart, heart, pulling on heartstrings. There you go. That's the word. <laughs> but the old man is a recurring character that we love and um, to die either. we don't want him to die either, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's, that's such a beautiful scene. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. Uh, do you have any comments that you didn't get to cover that you would like to mention in the next few minutes? Or did you cover everything you want? Go for it. What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I kind of did what I came here for. Uh, I would be interested to know from others what makes an ending kind of satisfying or not satisfying. And especially are there kinds of endings that you usually dislike that you can be sold on and vice versa. Like one, one thing I wanted to talk about that I didn't really get to was like, in some ways the last unicorn thing is the thing that gets so overdone in movies, especially in horror movies. This was where I was gonna talk about horror where the way you defeat the monster is you like just stop caring that it's a monster or whatever. You like, if, you, if you're not afraid of it, it can't hurt you, which often feels cheap and almost like victim blaming, right? Like the victims didn't have enough willpower to not be afraid of the monster, but our special heroes can. Uh, and I think in The Last Unicorn, it works in part because it plays more like martyrdom more like a kind of acceptance of whatever happens now, I am not going to do what the Red Bull wants. Um, there's more, there's less of a like, this is how I defeat the monster and more just, to, this is how I remain myself. This is how I continue to kind of like, mm, how to put, to not give in and whatever happens as a result of that happens. And in fact, that is how you defeat the Red Bull, uh, but it's not quite as kind of how to put, it's not as simple as just if you can kind of generate the correct feelings in yourself, then everything will be fixed. Uh, so that's a kind of story that people really want to tell in part because it's sort of true how martyrdom happens and how it defeats the powers of this world literally is just that people aren't afraid uh, and they're not afraid to die. And that is the, the political philosophy I was going to get into was the idea that that, that martyrdom exposes the weakness of the state uh, in a profound way at the moment when the state appears to be most powerful because it's destroying the bodies of the martyrs. It's in fact like precisely in that moment, it was sort of putting on blast the fact that it could not make them comply, uh, that, there, that it failed uh, to turn them into good citizens. Uh, and that's kind of the truth that all the, to me, often very boring narratives of if you just believe uh, hard enough, the monster will go away. That's the truth that those stories are kind of getting at. Thank you. That, that, was, that was a really excellent answer. And what you were saying at the very beginning about wanting to hear what other people have to say, we now have an opportunity to do that because we're ready to go to our breakout sessions where you are both very um, invited to participate in the breakouts and uh, hear what people are saying about your talks and you know um, address any issues and uh, interact with the attendees. So we're going to cut now from the, the main session and go to the breakouts. The breakouts are on the, um, the Doxicon uh, list of sessions that